So this is Greg Allison with Galactic Gregs coming to you from an undisclosed coordinate somewhere in the Milky Way galaxy. You're about to hear a presentation from Richard Hoover on life in the universe. He'll be talking about concepts such as panspermia. He'll be talking about where did life originate in the universe. He'll be showing you pictures of what is presented as microfossils in meteorites. And he's gonna show you living organisms that look just like these fossils. This is gonna knock your socks off because he has lots of photographs of these fossils and microorganisms on Earth that look just like those fossils. Not a few, but a lot. The correlation is mind boggling. You know, so this is a presentation you might wanna pay attention to. Where did life originate? How did life come upon the earth so fast, so complex in single cell organisms? Uh, how did DNA get started? A lot of good questions. And I'm sure a lot of you have your answers already, but this will be a very interesting and very entertaining uh, presentation. I do apologize in advance. Uh, Richard Hoover took up the center aisle of the big table and his computer and and he had a little camera on the computer to record it. So I had to come off to the side of my tripod and it made kind of switching back and forth between him and the screen clunkier. I have since done a little better job than that in the subsequent program on uh, crime scene investigation. Unfortunately, that time I ran out of memory on my card. <laughs> but in any event, so um, hope you enjoy this program. And remember, please subscribe to my channel and bang the bell for update notifications because there's gonna be a lot more presentations talks, some interviews with other people of, of great interest. And I'll be talking some about various theories and things about space, exploration, rocketry. And I have videos on a lot of development of hybrid rocket motors that I hope in the future to convert from VHS tapes and upload because we did do a major hybrid rocket development here with the Huntsville, Alabama L5 Society's HALO program. And later, a company we spun off known as the High Altitude Research Corporation. We launched hybrid rockets from balloons in a process known as a raccoon, balloon launched rocket. And we had some great adventures, and hopefully we'll find some way to share some of that with you. In any event, enjoy the program. A delight to be back uh, with you this evening, and uh, we're going to be talking uh, today about uh, life in the universe. Uh, by way of introduction, I wanted to point out that one of the most important and interesting questions of philosophy and science is the question of where, when, and how did life originate? This is a problem that is indeed intriguing because uh, we really don't know uh, the answers. Uh, some of the questions are did life originate uh, on Earth and did it, does it exist only on Earth? In fact, there are there are a lot of people who have the opinion that extraterrestrial life doesn't exist. I found that out uh, in 2011 when I published a paper on microfossils and meteorites and a gentleman at NASA headquarters said, we know this paper can't be right because we know extraterrestrial life doesn't exist. And I was rather curious as to when we made the measurements of Europa and Enceladus and also those planets in Andromeda, but uh, I didn't get a response with regard to that. Did life that exists on Earth originate on Earth, or was it brought to Earth from somewhere else? And uh, it, one of the topics that is now coming to be well accepted is the idea that water and organics were brought to the primordial Earth. However, there have been a number of recent discoveries in space missions and the scanning electron microscopy studies of meteorites that may provide some important answers to these questions. Well, by way of preview, I want to point out that water and ice exists on comets, planets, and moons. In fact, uh, water is a profoundly important compound. Uh, it is the most abundant. Uh, if, where you have a true compound, water is the most abundant uh, compound. Extrasolar planets, we now know, are extremely common, very abundant, because we've had all these wonderful discoveries uh, that have been made in the last couple of decades. Microbial extremophiles are capable of living in ice and 
in deep crustal rocks within the crust of the earth. They're also capable of surviving for millions of years, and you'll see details of a lot of these points. They can remain alive while frozen in permafrost or ice. They can remain alive while desiccated in crystals of salt. And there are fossils of cyanobacteria and diatoms and other microorganisms that exist and are present in carbonaceous meteorites. And those meteorites are thought to be the remains of comets. Well, there, okay. A bit of history, the idea that life uh, originated on the planet Earth goes all the way back to 560 BC and Examander uh, came up with the hypothesis of spontaneous generation that life could just appear from non-living matter. Uh, Anaxagoras, about 450 BC, uh, had a totally different idea, and that was that uh, there were seeds everywhere, and that biology, that organisms simply came to Earth as a result of material being brought into the Earth's atmosphere, and that, of course, became known as the exogenous origin hypothesis. In 1861, Louis Pasteur did a very important experiment and proved that the spontaneous generation theory simply isn't correct. Lord Kelvin revived the panspermia hypothesis in 1871, but then at the same year, Darwin, with his origin of life by natural processes in a warm little pond, essentially uh, put a very, very solid foundation for the endogenous origin hypothesis. In 1903, Arrhenius revived the panspermia hypothesis, and then that was greatly advanced by Sir Fred Hoyle and John Ward Ramasinghe in 1986. Oparin in 1924 gave great advances to the chemical evolution model, but he also suggested that asteroids and meteorites and interstellar dust particles could have delivered water and organics, prebiotics, to the early Earth. In 1953, Miller and Urey performed their very important classical experiment in which they showed that lightning bolts and uh, volcanic uh, eruptions and so forth could form uh, with, with a primordial primitive atmosphere, could form a group of amino acids. And when that was uh, done, the scientific community essentially came to the conclusion that the origin of life problem was solved. All you have to do is have some uh, energy and uh, uh, the uh, uh, gases that you would find in an early Earth atmosphere, and through a very long, slow uh, process of prebiotic chemistry, you would ultimately wind up with the complex organic chemicals that were needed for life, and then a protocell and ultimately uh, the, uh, the presence of, of living biological cells. Uh, different. Uh, well, uh, so the fundamental question then is uh, this paradigm that has become completely accepted by the scientific community of the endogenous origin of life on Earth, is it valid? And that's what I want to examine tonight. Are there reasons to accept it or reason to consider that it may in fact not be valid? Uh, the idea that Earth life originated elsewhere and was delivered to Earth by spores or intact cells is the alternate uh, hypothesis known as panspermia. Von Helmholtz made an interesting point in 1871. Who could say whether comets and meteorites, uh, meteors which swarm, ever, swarm everywhere through space may not scatter germs wherever a new world has reached the stage in which it is a suitable place for organic beings. This is the basis of the cometary panspermia hypothesis. And Arrhenius uh, advanced it in a slightly different way, in indicating that he thought that it might be possible that spores or single-celled organisms might be propelled by radiation pressure and travel from one body of the solar system to another. Orgel and Crick in 1973 came up with a really amazing uh, hypothesis, that is, uh, extraterrestrial intelligent alien beings seeded the planet Earth as a way of studying uh, uh, the evolution of life, and uh, that became known as direct panspermia. And Hoyle and Wickramasinghe then uh, solidly advanced the uh, uh, panspermia hypothesis with the work that they did in the last few decades. Well, I'd like to talk a little bit about what we know about life, because in order to make, consider these points, it's necessary to review some things. Every living organism that we have on Earth has an absolute requirement in order for it to grow and metabolize 
for a coexistence of water, and that water can be either liquid or solid or gas, uh, with energy, you have to have some source of energy. It can be a chemical source, it can be food, it can be radiation, it can be heat or light, and a small suite of bioelements. There are only about 21 elements of the periodic table of the elements, which now comprise 118, uh, that are important for life, that are essential for life. And by far, the most important of those are the CHON, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. Uh, phosphorus and sulfur are also considered major bi uh, biogenic elements, but they're much less important than the carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. Then you have the minor elements we see here and a group of trace elements. Carbon and nitrogen fixation are absolutely essential for life on Earth because of the simple reason that you need to be able to take carbon away from carbon dioxide, from the oxygen, or from carbonates in rocks, and get organic carbon. And tremendous problem is, well, actually it's a fortunate thing, that nitrogen forms a triple bond. And so the N2 molecule in the atmosphere is very, very strongly held together. That's good, because otherwise we might have nitrogen combining with oxygen and the atmosphere catching on fire, which is not conducive to life. So that's the reason that farmers use ammonium nitrate for their, uh, their fertilizers. Uh, and we'll see in a little while the very important way that microorganisms contribute and, and play a critical role in this process of nitrogen fixation. Water is the most abundant molecule in the universe where you have two uh, elements in the compound. 60 to 70 percent of the mass of all living cells is nothing but water. It has a polar uh, bent uh, crystal geometry. The HOH bond angle is 104.5 degrees. And that gives rise to profoundly important uh, properties of water. It uh, expands on freezing, which means that lakes and rivers freeze from the top up, uh, uh, top down rather than the bottom up. If it were the other way around, I wouldn't be able to make this talk this evening because there would be no life on Earth. The other important thing is the high surface tension and boiling point, but very, very interesting point. Water has maximum density at plus 3.4 degrees Celsius for fresh water and minus 3 degrees Celsius for seawater. That, since we know that liquids of different density, the most dense liquid always sinks to the bottom, that means that I can stand here this evening and tell you with absolute certainty that based on the laws of physics and chemistry, all of the deep oceans and deep lakes everywhere in the universe are alike. If you were to go to Europa and send a probe through the ice crust of Europa and go down into the water, the temperature near the bottom regions of that water are going to be plus 3.4 if the water of Europa is, uh, is a uh, fresh water, uh, minus 3 if it's salt water, which means that in the deep oceans you don't have climate change. In fact, for the last 4.5 billion years, those regimes have been absolutely stable everywhere in the universe. The other thing that is very exciting about that is that means that we could take living biology from the Marianas Trench and transport it to the sea underneath the icy crust of Pluto, and once it got there, it would probably feel totally at home. So, Water is absolutely fine-tuned for life. It is essential to the structure, stability, dynamics, and function of biological macromolecules. It mediates chain collapse and protein folding, interaction between the binding partners and search for native topology by a funnel energy landscape. It actively participates in molecular recognition and interactions between the binding partners and contributes to enthalpic and entropic stabilization. So water is not just an inert environment but it's an integral and active component of biomolecular systems with both dynamic and structural roles. Ah, energy. You've got to have a source of energy. But that source of energy can be very greatly uh, diverse. We've known for a long time that cyanobacteria are among the most abundant uh, photoautotrophs on, on Earth. They, uh, normally live by taking sunlight, carrying out photosynthesis, and, and growing in that kind of way. Most recently, a, an astonishing discovery of the deep crust of the Earth revealed that the dominant organism in the deep crustal rocks are cyanobacteria. 
So there are many, many astonishing and amazing things that are being discovered every day about microbial extremophiles. Life is characterized by a metabolism, DNA and RNA driven ordering chem of chemical complexity, motility, growth, reaction to stimuli, and cell reproduction. One of the most amazing things is that there is a way, I, a lot of people say, well, we can't put a life detection experiment on a spacecraft because how would we recognize life if we see it? Extraterrestrial life might be totally different than terrestrial life. Well, there is a way to recognize life. You can tell a difference very quickly between a dead dog and a live dog. And the main difference is because there is no internal cellular motility. This is a beautiful example of that. This is from a sample I collected several years ago in, in Lake Gunnersville. This is a magnificent little wheeled animal called a vorticella. Uh, and this is all being done in real time. But notice here, all of these internal structures that are moving around there. Uh, you also saw bacteria swimming around. Uh, and those big green things were Lingvia cyanobacteria. So that gives you an idea of the size. So there are these complex metabolic pathways in living organisms that take these bioelements and combine them to form very precisely ordered homochiral polymeric biomolecules. Proteins, enzymes, organelles for replication, internal cellular movements, uh, transfer of biomolecules across membranes. You've got to bring material into the interior of the cell and you've got to expel the waste material to the exterior of the cell. And also, these are used for the construction of cellular components and locomotion. This is really a, a beautiful uh, piece of work here. You may have never seen the periodic table of the elements look like this, because I want you to notice there are absolutely no blank spots here. Uh, these were, for, for many, many years, until actually last December, these were left blank because uh, they were not yet uh, identified, not yet uh, named by the IUPAC, and now they are. They're named uh, Neonium, Florobium, Muscovium, Livermorium after Livermore, Tennessee after Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and Oganesson after uh, Academician Yuri Oganesian. The reason I show this is because it is important to note that 70% of an E. coli in all cells basically is water. And 98% is this uh, C-H-O-N, right there. That is basically life. You have a little bit of phosphorus, a little bit of sulfur, but you can actually write a, a simple chemical formula for a living cell, and to a fairly degree, high degree of, of accuracy, uh, it is C4H7O2N1. Uh, and if you take the phosphorus and the sulfur, 99% of the cell mass is made of CHONPS. Cells are basically 75% water, 15% protein, and 6% RNA. Uh, by the way, Academician Oganessian is now the only living human being to have a chemical element named for him. <coughs> well, these important biomolecules include things like nucleobases, uh, the nitrogenous uh, uh, bases, uh, the purines, and the guanine, and pyrimidines, uh, th uh, cytosine, thymine, and uracil. Of course, that's absolutely essential for DNA and RNA, and there's nothing that we know that lives that does not have RNA or RNA plus DNA. Uh, there have to be D-sugars, uh, ribose and deoxyribose are just two examples, but they are essential for RNA and DNA. Uh, they link the nucleobase uh, to the phosphate groups of the RNA and DNA. Carbohydrates are needed for cell walls and energy storage. Lipids, fatty acid esters for biological membranes and triglycerides uh, for energy storage is an example. Also, after organisms die, these uh, complex uh, uh, organic molecules start breaking down and you get humic and fulvic acids. Uh, uh, and then uh, uh, you also get pristane and phytane, which are the breakdown products of chlorophyll and vanadium porphyrins. Uh, a magnesium porphyrin is the component of chlorophyll and uh, an iron porphyrin is the component of hemoglobin, both of which are essential for energy transport. The most common carbon in carbonaceous meteorites is what we call kerogen. It's a vast uh, uh, polymeric molecule. Uh, my 
dear colleague Elena Picuda says that uh, it doesn't get eaten because it's such a big molecule, the bacteria can't get their teeth around it, uh, which I think is a very elegant uh, analogy. Uh, of course, kerogen is in uh, mature terrestrial kerogens, they're in coal, they're in uh, uh, oil and so forth, and uh, uh, so it's a very great fortune that uh, they are quite resistant to uh, a biological attack. Chirality, particularly homochirality, is the signature of life. Uh, chirality is that you have a left-handed and a right-handed glove. Uh, you have left-handed and right-handed crystals. So the way Pasteur discovered this in 1848, when uh, he noticed that uh, the paratartaric acid, if it was made albiotically, uh, it did not rotate the plane of polarization of visible light. Uh, if it was produced by grapes, for example, uh, it would produce the, uh, uh, the uh, optical activity or the rotation of the polarization of visible light. Uh, it is now well established that in living organisms, all of the amino acids and proteins are all the L enantiomer, and all of the sugars in DNA and RNA are the D enantiomer. However, if you make amino acids by an abiotic process, by Miller urea synthesis, etc., you get equal numbers, equal numbers of D and L. Well, that is a very important distinction between uh, living things and non-living things. There we go. So, in, in an amino acid, you have the amine group we have here. That amine functional group is linked to this alpha carbon, and then it's bonded to the uh, uh, to a hydrogen and a carboxylic acid with a variable uh, R side chain, and it is the nature of this side chain that gives rise to all of the different amino acids that are present. Here shows the uh, configuration of L alanine and D alanine. They're exactly the same chemical composition, it's just that the, the, ge the or geometry of the uh, molecule uh, are reversed, so that they're like uh, left handed and right handed gloves. This is a peptide. And basically all of the chiral amino acids of all the peptides and, and proteins are exclusively the L enantiomer, and they're all encoded by the genetic code. If you take living organisms after they have died and you find a fish at the bottom of the sea that has been buried for several hundred thousands of years, uh, it can still contain amino acids, but the amino acids will be receiving. They will be equal numbers of D and L. And in fact, there were a number of people, Jeffrey Beta and others, that realized that you could use the degree of racemization of the different types of amino acid for uh, a, a base of science known as amino acid geochronometry. And so you could determine the age of a deposit by the relative uh, D and L uh, concentration of different amino acids. Now, the reason this is all important is it goes back to carbonaceous meteorites. And the amino acids in the carbonaceous meteorites exhibit chirality. Tagish-like Tag meteorite has an enantiomeric excess of the L amino acid of 60%, uh, del 13 C of plus 24 to plus 29, clearly proving that it is extraterrestrial amino, amino acids, but that it has chirality. Now, there were many people, when people started studying amino acids in carbonaceous meteorites early on back in the 60s, the first reports were that the amino acids were all racemic. And everybody said, well, you see, that's because all of the amino acids in the meteorites were made without biology. They were formed by simple chemical processes within, uh, within the uh, parent body of the meteorite. Well, it turns out that this presence of of uh, a very significant excess of chirality in the, in the meteorites is a very strong evidence of biology on the parent body of the meteorites. Now we go back to water. Water is found on all the planets of the solar system. It's present on all of the moons uh, uh, that we, we have here. Uh, it's present in comets and water-bearing asteroids. And so, of course, it's in great molecular clouds. Water is just so widely distributed, it's even present in places that a few years ago, decades or so ago, anybody would have said, I'm, I was, thought I was absolutely insane for telling you that there's water on Mercury. But in 2014, Messenger Neutron Spectrometer confirmed water ice in these 
and dark, fro or dark frozen organics in the uh, Kadensky and Prokofiev craters at the North Pole of Mercury. Scientists have recently discovered water ice in the craters at the poles of our own moon in very deep craters, and these were caused by impacts of comets delivering water that remained frozen at the pole of the moon. And the reason that is very exciting is one could go to the north pole of the moon and very quickly and easily explore different comets rather than having to try to chase after the comets in space, rendezvous with them and take samples. Uh, this is something I'm working with the, the, the Russians on. And we're looking at uh, hopefully developing a, an experiment to search for uh, mi microbial life in uh, cometary ice in the poles of the moon. On Earth, extremophiles inhabit uh, coal regimes, uh, polar ice caps and permafrost, geysers, fumaroles, uh, deep hot crustal rocks and hydrothermal vents, acidic, hyperalkaline and hypersaline pools like Blood Falls, Owen Lake and Lake Undersea, high radiation environment, they're found growing on spent nuclear fuel rods, high pressure environments like the uh, Marianas Trench and Lake Vostok and the hard vacuum of uh, Mir and the International Space Station and they certainly could inhabit uh, the ice or, or water of comets uh, or the oceans of other planets or, or moons. This is a lovely microorganism called Spirochaeta americana that we discovered in a sample I collected in, uh, in uh, Mono Lake. Uh, you see the magnificent way that this beautiful little spiral organism swims. The point I'm making here is Dr. Pakuda and I have found several different species. We described Spirochaeta americana from Mono Lake. We described Spirochaeta dissipatotropha. And by looking in the microscope, it is possible to identify that organism just by how it swims. You can identify it to genus and species. So the point is, if one takes a sampler to allow water from the polar cap of the, of the moon, from the crater of the moon, to enter into a flat capillary that's in the focal plane of a microscope. You could tell the difference between Brownian motion, between current drift, and between locomotion. And wherever you find locomotion, <coughs> innate motility, you have found positive evidence of life. We don't have to know anything about the DNA. We don't have to know anything about the metabolism. All we have to know is it is capable of expending the enormous amount of energy in order to swim in water, which has an extremely high viscosity. I, I, I was employed at NASA for several years. I, I, I'm not going to tell Billy Jones, who was my boss, I've really never worked at NASA. Uh, I, I was there. They paid me, but I had fun the whole time I was there. <laughs> I'm sure Billy knows that. <laughs> And one of the things that I greatly enjoyed is after 1997, I became heavily involved in astrobiology and made trips to many, many interesting places. This is the Matanuska Glacier of Alaska. Uh, this is the ice cave in the uh, Schirmacher Oasis of Antarctica. Uh, this is a magnificent ice cave, the uh, Kvarkovat uh, ice cave of the Vyadnakul ice cap of Iceland. And, and here uh, is uh, uh, in an ice cave in the tops of the Alps. And here I had an opportunity to be at the South Pole with uh, Owen Garriott and uh, Jim Lovell. Actually got a chance to sleep in a tent with Jim Lovell in a tiny tent. Uh, his uh, feet were about that far away from my nose and my feet were that far from his nose. But it doesn't count because you can't smell anything in Antarctica, it's much too cold. <laughs> uh, this is Sabit of Wiesel. Sabit uh, was the first one to argue that there would be life in, in ancient ice, and particularly in deep ice above Lake Vostok. Uh, he was at the Institute of Microbiology, and the uh, director, M. Shinetsky, and all the people at the Institute of Microbiology thought Sabit was just a little bit crazy for having such a ridiculous idea. So in order to... Uh, uh, solve the problem, they sent him to Antarctica to Bostock Station to drill in the ice. And Sabit is an incredibly brave individual. He wintered over at Bostock Station on three separate occasions. And any human being who has wintered over at Bostock has got an enormous amount of courage because if you're outside for just a few minutes in the Antarctic night, uh, you can easily die. Uh, it's a very, very dangerous place. But, this is the drilling platform that they had at Vostok Station. 
And Sabit brought a number of samples to me back in 1997 from Vostok. This is from the, uh, from the 2,827 meter core, and those are clearly diatoms from within the deep ice, and they had just reproduced before they were frozen. So, in addition to that, uh, new studies have now, sh they have succeeded in penetrating the ice of uh, Lake Vostok, and there are a host of micro microorganisms living in the Vostok ice. Uh, this is an organism that we call Carnobacterium plasticinium <coughs> from, uh, from the Fox Tunnel of Alaska. This is a moss that we had growing uh, from, uh, from the Fox Tunnel. That is a 32,000 year old moss. We, we also described this new bacterial species and we named it Carnobacterium plasticinium. Uh, this is in the uh, Kvergivet Ice Cave in, in Iceland. Uh, this was filmed by the, uh, uh, the BBC uh, for a, a program that, uh, that they uh, uh, called Wonders of the Solar System. Uh, Brian Cox, that's uh, available on, on, uh, 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 the, uh, uh, on TV now. Uh, forgotten the series it's with. Uh, but I went there and uh, uh, collected samples of, of uh, ice, uh, uh, drilling a spike, a sterile spike, into the ice and then pushing the lower levels of the glacial ice uh, out into a sterile tube. Uh, this is Brian Cox. And uh, when, uh, when we took that back to the laboratory, uh, I had told him that I was convinced that there would be living microorganisms, living bacteria in that deep glacial ice. He was quite skeptical, but we took it uh, back to the, to the laboratory, and when we got it there, uh, we put it uh, under the microscope, and there, as soon as the ice thawed out, there were the bacteria swimming and exhibiting this uh, very, very beautiful kind of, of locomotion. Uh, so these bacteria had been frozen in the glacier for in excess of 100,000 years, and yet they were, they were completely ready to come out and swim as soon as the ice thawed. Now, the thing that is uh, very exciting is uh, this particular bacterium, which uh, w swims very, very rapidly. Uh, we have now gotten the entire genome of that organism sequenced. Uh, it turns out that it's a, an entirely new species, new genus, and new family of, of life. This is a new genus, new species, and new family that we na named uh, Wibmania terracasi. Uh, that was described last December. Uh, that was obtained from uh, uh, the deep, we drilled through 10 meters of ice at uh, uh, Lake Untersay, and then I dropped camera bottles uh, sitting on my hands and knees for three days, uh, lowering these camera bottles into the water above the deep anoxic trough, and then I would send down a messenger that would open the bottle and another that would close the bottle. And these were brought up, and, and from the, uh, uh, the 96 meter level, uh, this organism was discovered. Uh, it's, it's this long, slender rod, and it has puff balls on the top, looking very much like a dandelion. Uh, in fact, uh, when we first described it, we were calling it uh, in the paper William Whit Whitmania dandelioni. Uh, they wouldn't let us do that. They said that no, we had to give it a, a name that was in Latin. So uh, we said, okay. So we call it William Wigmania terracasi, uh, terracasi being the name of dandelion in Latin. There's always more than one way to skin it, but skin a bacterium. <laughs> uh, I showed something similar to that. We'll, oops. Yes. Uh, this is the ice cave at uh, 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 ice sculptures at Lake Potrunia here. Uh, this is the ice cave in the Schermacher Oasis. Uh, and this is a new species that we described as uh, Sanguibacter, uh, uh, Gelutus statuaria, uh, after ice sculpture. Uh, and we published that uh, about uh, 2017, uh, two years ago. Uh, and this, this is the Uba. Uh, this little ice baby was found in uh, Siberia by an Indigirk uh, caribou hunter. 
And if you see these bacteria are swimming very nicely, some of them get stuck and they spin around and, and so forth, but you can see the, the motility is some go one way and then twist around and head out the other way. Liuba has an interesting history. Uh, uh, it, it, when she was found, the caribou hunter uh, thought it was a caribou because she was on a bar, sandbar. And when he went up to the sandbar, he discovered that this was no caribou. This was an incredibly well-preserved baby mammoth uh, of, of uh, 40,000 years age. That's the cover of the National Geographic where Liuba was described. Uh, and, and discussed in, in great detail. Uh, I was very interested in this and uh, uh, the, my colleague at the University of Michigan that was studying Luba sent me interesting samples, so I have in my freezer at home samples of the, the heart, lungs, liver, uh, teeth, and stomach milk of baby Luba. I have an unusual freezer. <laughs> one of the things that was exciting about this is there was a big, th a big fight going on, and uh, one of the uh, parts of the fight was that it was believed by many that Liuba sank in quicksand of the Lena River and inhaled the sand and mud into her, her tusk and suffocated. The other theory was that Liuba, in fact, drowned when she fell into the Lena River. Uh, and, and by looking at the stomach milk, I found this. These are cyanobacterial filaments, and the nice thing is they're 40,000 years old, but to my great astonishment, that cyanobacterial filament, even though it was 40,000 years old, contained a teeny bit of nitrogen. That's less than what you typically see, but it's very, very unusual to have ancient so biological material with, with nitrogen, but it's clearly not enough nitrogen for it to be modern biological material. But the presence of that cyanobacteria in Luba's stomach milk was very interesting because baby mammoths drink only milk and you would not find cyanobacteria in milk, which means that this little girl fell into the river and drowned. One of the interesting points people argued for a long time, well, there isn't any water on Mars. In fact, NASA has been continually saying we must, uh, we must follow the water. That became the paradigm, even though Pioneer discovered polar ice caps on Mars so back in the very early days of space research. And, and it's been known for ages that the polar caps of Mars are basically frozen water ice that in the wintertime gets an apron about six meters thick of uh, of carbon dioxide ice, but in the summer that CO2 ice goes away and you're left with about a 3.4 kilometer thick layer of H2O ice. And yet we've been saying, well, we're trying to find if there ever was water on Mars. Well, I'm saying, gee guys, what is it about the H2O molecule and water that you can't seem to connect just because it happens to be frozen? Now, the reason that we can say that there is, in fact, liquid water on Mars from time to time, in fact, currently, is here you see these, uh, this patterned ground and you see double rim polygons. Uh, these are double rim polygons in, in uh, 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 Siberia. I got very familiar with double rim polygons because I fell down numerous times when I was in northeast Siberia with the Russians and I would be walking along and all of a sudden Here's this mound about six inches high with grass and stuff growing all over it and you stub your foot into it and take a tumble. Uh, in fact, I almost got killed in Siberia. I was walking along uh, collecting little liverworts and mosses and, uh, and neat little, there were little, little flowers that were about that tall with beautiful little blossoms But I was there in the summertime. Uh, and I'm walking along collecting all these things, putting them in my bag and, and I see a big area that's just completely barren and I thought, what in the world happened here? And then I went a little further and there's a big hole in the ground. And then on the other side of the hole in the ground, there are a couple of caribou ribs. And I said, whoa, I know what that is. That's the wolf's den. Because there was a male and female and three cubs that would sit up on the hillside and watch us drill. And then I realized, wait a minute, that wolf family might not appreciate me visiting them. And, and I had no way of protecting myself except to skedaddle over to the, uh, the snow bank where I was collecting red snow algae. But fortunately, they were out hunting for something that, that was tastier than me, so I had no problem getting away. 
There's the polar cap of Mars, uh, and this is in the summertime. Uh, and in fact, the uh, gamma ray spectrometer of NASA Odyssey shows that this was 95% pure water ice in uh, Planum uh, Boreum of the order of 3 million cubic kilometers in the north polar cap of frozen H2O. And on May the 18th, 1979, it snowed on Mars uh, in Utopia Planitia at the Viking 2 lander site. And that image was obtained in 1979, and NASA released that photograph in 1997. I called Gil Levin and asked him what he thought about the picture of snow on Mars. He said, Richard, what are you smoking? I said, Gil, I'm looking at a picture of snow on Mars. He said, they don't have anything like that. I said, would you like a copy? He said, very much so. The reason he knew they didn't have one is he'd gone to NASA headquarters and looked at every photograph that had been taken by the Viking mission because Gil was one of the Viking PIs. But there it was, a beautiful color picture that should have been on the cover of Science, on the cover of Nature, on the cover of Scientific American or the New York Times, but it was kept hidden until 1997. And how can I say for sure that that is water ice rather than frozen carbon dioxide? Well, the reason is the detector temperature was minus 18.10 Celsius. And you don't get carbon dioxide to freeze at minus 18 Celsius. Jim Lovell and I would go to sleep in our tent at minus 40 and wake up at minus 20. And when I'd see white stuff all over the bottom of the tent, I didn't think it was because our breath was freezing. I thought it was because Jim had tracked in a bunch of snow. I never did. I always was careful not to track in snow. <laughs> This is a beautiful, uh, beautiful image showing uh, uh, the Dawn spacecraft's uh, discovery of, of water and organics on the asteroid Ceres. Uh, there also is evidence of, uh, of water, uh, actually recent liquid water flows uh, in uh, uh, Fora Vesta in the Cornelia Crater. Uh, so here we have two asteroids also showing, uh, showing water. This is uh, asteroid uh, Bennu, Osiris uh, Rex uh, just visited Bennu very, very recently. And not only did it find uh, uh, these incredible uh, mineral structures, uh, Bennu is totally covered over by clay minerals. Now that is extremely fascinating because you don't get clay by just breaking down silicates. Clay on Earth is formed with, in the presence of and with the aid of microbial life. So, the, this clay on, on uh, uh, Bennu, the scientific community is now saying, well, that proves that there was water on the parent body of Bennu. I say it is much more important than that because I think it is very strong evidence that there was life on the parent body of Bennu. Uh, these beautiful images uh, obtained by, by Voyager of Ponomara Chaos on Europa, showing all these very interesting colors the bright red regions of uh, Minoas Linnea. Uh, and in, uh, in Antarctica, we, uh, we, this was my snow algae that I was going to collect when uh, I escaped the wolves. Uh, Herminus uh, glacii of Greenland and our Carnobacterium Pleistocene. Uh, this is uh, uh, Lake Untersee, which is a perennially ice-covered lake. Uh, we drill through this ice, and underneath the ice, there were beautiful red uh, stromatolites. We now know that this is water uh, being released from uh, water ice geysers from the south pole of Europa. And uh, this is an artist's rendition of what those, uh, those geysers must look like. Uh, but this is an actual photograph showing the water ice geysers uh, escaping. Uh, the Enceladus, Saturn's moon, uh, near these cracks called the Tiger Stripes, there is uh, water escaping into space. Now, the fascinating thing of the water escaping from Europa and from Enceladus, comets traveling from deep out in our solar system, traveling through these regimes of water that have been ejected from those bodies, if there is biology in the form of microorganisms or whatever uh, it being ejected, uh, and a comet swings through and picks up some of this, uh, this water, it could very easily transport that biology in frozen state from Enceladus or Europa to chunks of debris that break off the comet as it comes near the Earth and 
that material travel into the Earth's atmosphere and ultimately land in oceans or rivers or lakes of Earth. And human beings would come along and see those cyanobacteria or diatoms, whatever they might be, and would say, well, but those are Earth life because we would have no way of knowing that they may well have originated in the polar caps of, of Mars or in the, uh, uh, the deep crustal rocks underneath the surface of Mars or in the oceans of Europa or Enceladus or possibly even Uranus, Neptune or, Tri or Triton which also has uh, uh, evidence of water, surface water ice, uh, nitrogen and methane. One of the very exciting things, the New Horizons mission has found evidence of water, ocean, and organics. Uh, the red colors are attributed to tolens, which are somewhat similar to kerogen. Uh, you can make these in the laboratory, or at least you can make things that are this kind of reddish gunk that Carl Sagan called tolens. Uh, uh, they, they wanted to call it star char. That was one of the proposed names, but now they accept it on the name tolens. You see this deep red color. Uh, here you see evidence of, of cracking and, and uh, reorienting of chunks of ice on the surface of, uh, of Pluto and Sputnik Planum. Uh, that provides very strong evidence that this whole crust of ice is actually floating on a liquid water ocean. Uh, New Horizons uh, went on this kind of trajectory using Jupiter and it came past uh, Pluto and then continued on outward in a most, most magnificent way on uh, New Year's Eve. New Horizons spacecraft traveled within 2,200 meters of this beautiful little trans-Neptunium object in the Kuiper Belt. And here's a color picture showing that <laughs> Ultima Thule is indeed red, uh, which is consistent with the, uh, uh, with the uh, presence of Toland <coughs> on this contact binary. 4.1 billion miles away from Earth, it took six and a half years, uh, six and a half, uh, uh, six and a half years, it took six and a half hours for the light to get from, uh, from uh, Ultima Thule to planet Earth, whereas it only takes eight minutes uh, for light to get from the sun to the Earth. Well, it's well been uh, accepted for a long time that there's a very strong probability that uh, comets delivered water to the Earth's oceans, and, and that, those kind of conclusions were made primarily from the Robert et al. studies of uh, deuterium hydrogen ratios, and here is a tabulation of deuterium hydrogen ratio, the D to H times 10 to minus 6. Comets is in this range, Ci1 carbonaceous meteorites, completely over engulfs this. Earth's ocean is about 149. The protosolar nebula is 21, which is far out of that range, Jupiter and Saturn, interstellar medium. So this is very consistent with comets delivering water to the Earth's primordial oceans. Uh, well, it, it, it was shown by uh, Vega that the nucleus of Comet Halley got up to 300 to 400 Kelvin. So, in spite of the fact that people always thought that comets were extremely cold, in fact, comets can get quite warm. Temperature of 400 Kelvin at 0.88 AU, that is Halley's Comet. And this shows the reflectance of, uh, of Hadia, which is uh, an asteroid in Tagish Lake. A very nice, uh, a very nice agreement uh, between uh, these dark solar system objects uh, and the D asteroid 368 Hadia and the Tagish Lake meteorite. We actually have bits of Stardust. The, uh, the uh, mission, uh, uh, the uh, Stardust mission, actually went and took samples of Comet Bill 2, and when that was analyzed, it was found that it contained uh, glycine and low-temperature minerals, and northite and cubonite, and those minerals are formed only in the presence of liquid water. So here is another definitive line of evidence that there was liquid water present on the parent body of the uh, of the Comet Bill 2. And those minerals, the northite and cubonite, are also found in the CI1 and the CM2 carbonaceous chondrites. Look at the flaring here. Uh, this is uh, on comet 9P Temple 1, out beyond the orbit of Mars, and you saw this tremendous explosion where chunks of the crust gave way and an explosion occurred from the body of the comet getting hot and causing steam as the, uh, the uh, water and other volatiles vaporized and then applied pressure to the crust. 
And in fact, it's interesting that when Sunshine et al. published this picture uh, that was published uh, about 2000, they have this long re regime of the top of comet showing a temperature in Kelvin of 280 uh, to 295 or so, and then going up to 330 Kelvin at the front of the comet where the sun is shining on it. Well, it's kind of strange that they left off a very important temperature. They, they show this black and they say, well, it could be 280 Kelvin. Well, 273 is the magic number because 273 Kelvin is zero degrees Celsius, and that's the temperature at which H2O ice melts into liquid water. So, uh, but by leaving off 273, you kind of get away from that, well, we don't really think there's water on this, it's just uh, something else. The, the, the scientific community, by and large, is still of the opinion that there is no possibility of liquid water on comets, which is to me absolutely astonishing. Here is the beautiful 67B Cherry Mokarasimenka. Uh, and one of the things, this, uh, this picture was published and then withdrawn. But if you look at this, is the only color photograph of the entire comet that I've ever seen published. And if we look in, in, at, at take this area here, and oh, it's this area here, and enlarge it, you can see in this color images reds and pinks and sort of purples and little areas of dark blue and green. Uh, that is consistent with biology similar to cyanobacteria. Uh, this is a, a, another image showing rounded areas where explosions have happened on 67 uh, Cheryamov Gerasiminka and this is really exciting. Look at this picture, a movie showing these uh, explosions occurring and material being thrown out of 67P. Uh, so underneath that crust, as it got hot, a pocket of, of uh, ice melted, formed into liquid water. The liquid water then uh, exploded away a chunk of the crust and gave rise to a jet. And then we're seeing a snowstorm on Comet 67P. <coughs> because now all of these particles of water being thrown out to, along with dust and debris, uh, they start uh, solidifying as they get into space, and then they start coming back to the surface. So uh, that is, to me, one of the most amazing videos ever produced a, a snowstorm on a comet. Stardust's next image of 90's uh, Temple One. Uh, one of the things that is fascinating is that comets as they go around the sun, as they tumble in their, and, and rotate on their uh, uh, own axis as they come around the sun, they get hot and cold and hot and cold and occasionally chunks of the crust explode and, and break away and the water solute rapidly goes away into, into space. That means that you have the ability to concentrate the solutes from a large body of water down to a smaller body of water and the repetitive going to a temperature above the melting point of DNA and below the melting point of DNA means that if you had DNA in that pool of water you would do natural polymerase chain reaction to amplify the DNA so comets are essentially a natural regime wherein complex organic biomolecules can be formed and molecules like DNA could go through polymerase chain reaction to get tremendous amplification, which you could not easily do in oceans of Earth and you couldn't easily do in warm ponds because it's very, very difficult to get total evaporation and then quickly again enough rain to re, uh, resaturate and then evaporate and, and rain. But with the rotation of a comet as it goes around the sun and it starts getting hot, that would be an absolutely natural principle. Years ago, I did a paper with Sir Fred Hoyle that a number of people laughed at. They said, when pigs fly, uh, there could be diatoms on comets Europa and in interstellar space. Well, this shows the spectrum of GCIRS-7, uh, the galactic center source compared to a diatom model uh, between uh, about 3 and 12 microns. And here is the uh, spectrum of, of uh, uh, or that's the spectrum of comet Hale-Bopp. Uh, so, we get very, very nice agreement between uh, uh, diatoms and uh, or diatom type structures and uh, uh, the kind of 
of response characteristics that you get in the spectral properties of, uh, of these bodies. Cometary panspermia has some problems. It doesn't answer the fundamental question of the origin of life. How did it originate? I had a guy tell me he wasn't going to believe that there could be life in a comet until I could tell him exactly how life could originate on a comet. And I told him, well, I, I wasn't going to be able to help because I was so dumb I couldn't even tell him exactly how life originated on Earth. But if he could tell me, I was all ears. Well, he didn't have a good answer. The interesting point is, if living cells and spores could inhabit comets, then viable cells might be able to survive long exposures to space because comets have ice and rocks and they provide natural shielding from radiation environments uh, and, and they travel. So they are well, an excellent candidate for distribution of life throughout the universe. The main topic is microfossils in meteorites. Since 1997, I've been collaborating with Akademishin Rosenau and others at the Paleontological Institute of the Russian Academy of Sciences. And we independently found evidence for biology in carbonaceous meteorites. And of course, it was immediately attacked as these were modern contaminants. So I spent a great deal of time, actually about six years, trying to figure out how can you show their biology, uh, are they ancient, are they biological materials that are recent. This uh, evidence of biology in meteorites goes all the way back to the, uh, the LA meteorite that fell in 1806. Berzelius almost threw a sample away because he found it contained water. He thought it was contaminated. Then it turned out that that water was indigenous. Organics were found in the LA meteorite and Berzelius interpreted that as indicating the possibility of extraterrestrial life. In 1864, Pisani and Klotz found carbon, water, and organics similar to coal. And they also discovered that the Orgay meteorite disintegrates rapidly when dropped into water. Anagi reported organized elements in Orgay and Ibuna meteorites, and, and it was a tremendous fight that erupted immediately thereafter, uh, with the, uh, other people saying this was nothing more than modern biological contamination. The great paleontologist in St. Petersburg, Timofeyev, found acrotarchs in the Begay meteorite, and he was the father of the study of acrotarchs, and he knew that the acrotarchs that he was finding, like this, which he named as a new genus and a new species, were totally different than all of the acrotarchs he had studied before. Now, I study diatoms, and, and if I look at a marine uh, diatom slide, and there are some freshwater navicula in that slide, I would immediately say, oops, I contaminated. Because if you know the field, you can know what's supposed to be there and what's not supposed to be there. Well, Timofeyev found a lot of acrotarchs that he could not identify. And in fact, he described several new genera and species from the studies that he did of the meteorite. Malcolm Walters told me, well, the problem was acrotarchs are little tiny things and they fly around. And they probably just flew around from stuff he had in his laboratory and he got it contaminated. Well. I know better than that, because if they were stuff that he was working with, they would have been common acrotarchs, and he would have been able to recognize them. In 1997, independently with Academician Rosenhoff, I found cyanobacteria and acrotarchs in the LA and Orgay meteorites, and then we started doing a collaboration, and we found uh, that there are a large number of biological entities in a wide variety of carbonaceous meteorites. Uh, I've studied a number of samples from uh, Museum Paris, Montauban Museum, Planetary Studies Foundation, Victoria Museum in Melbourne, and very careful with the uh, protocols to make absolutely certain that nothing is contaminated, studying only interior, freshly uh, fractured, uncoated samples of the meteorites. So uh, these are the meteorites that I have studied. The ones that are in green, or Gaia, Tagish Lake, and so forth, uh, have abundant uh, microfossils. These that are yellow, the microfossils are present, but they're not as abundant as in these. And in red, even a CK4 Karunda and a CB3 Allende, I've never found uh, microfossils. Uh, also in, in these L4 meteorites, diogenites, and, uh, and, and uh, uh, the iron meteorites. Oops. These are biomolecules. Uh, there are 20 amino acids, actually 21 in all proteins. And, uh, and here are the eight amino acids that are found in Orgay and Murchison. There are 12 that are missing. 
Now, if this was contaminated with modern biology, all of the amino acids should be there. Several years ago, Academician Galimov of the Bernatsky Institute, uh, when I showed him my pictures of Murchison, he said, well, you know, Murchison has troubled me for a long time, too. And he pulled off a green book off the shelf and shows me this chart showing what he calls the uh, uh, thermodynamic isotropic fractionation uh, uh, beta sigma 13C plotted against del 13C. And these are amino acids in euglena and uh, uh, chlorella. Um, and uh, uh, I forgot which organism this is, and I can't read it, but three, three common terrestrial organisms and the Murchison meteorite. And you have the same relative abundance of valine, alanine, uh, uh, glutamic acid, and glycine, except the del 13C is dramatically different than uh, it's going from uh, plus 20 to plus 50 in the meteorite and from about minus 12 to minus 24 in terrestrial biological samples. So this proves that those amino acids are extraterrestrial. But Gallimaus said in his book that they had a remarkable, uh, remarkably similar abundance to what is found in terrestrial biology. And when I saw that, I said, this is the best non-microfossil -mic evidence that I've ever seen for the existence of extraterrestrial life. <laughs> And he said, well, yes, I guess I can see how you might interpret it that way. <laughs> it was his own book. <laughs> but he was having difficulty with that kind of an interpretation because the idea of microfossils and meteorites is still strongly opposed by many, many scientists. Well, you miss certain uh, things in the, in the meteorites. You don't find the nucleobase cytosine in the carbonaceous meteorites, and you don't find thymine. And those are both essential for DNA. So if you had modern biology, you would have certainly cytosine and thymine. You've got lots of uracil and you've got lots of xanthine. Well, it is known that cytosine degrades to uracil with a half-life of 70,000 years. Thymine degrades to xanthine with a half-life of 1.3 million years. So if you had biology on the parent body of the meteorite that died several half-lives for uh, uh, several times 1.3 million year half-lives, you would have exactly that situation. You would have these various, I mean, these various nuclear bases, and you would be missing the other life-critical nuclear bases that are absolutely essential for biology. Now, let's look at evidence. This is in the Orgay meteorite, and here we see individual cells within a thick sheet, and it's possible to see that this is a single linear chain, a trichome of cells. They're 1.8 microns in diameter and 5.5 microns in length. That is a Lingbia and is actually possible to identify the species as Lingbia spiralis. Here embedded in the rock are a whole host of cyanobacterial filaments like Microcoleus, uh, Formidium, and so forth in the, in the Orgay uh, meteorite. And when we look at it using energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy, we see something very interesting. Uh, in carbon, you can actually see a trace of this one. There is so much carbon there. But the carbon is pretty much uniformly distributed. And you can see a hint of that one in nitrogen. But basically, the nitrogen is pretty much the same as all the rest of the rock. In oxygen, this one stands out very clearly. But in magnesium and sulfur, ah, all of these things are absolutely brilliant. So what that means is that these filaments, after the organism died, they, the cells inside disintegrated. And so you had hollow sheets, very much like we have in terrestrial cyanobacteria after the cells inside died. And then a liquid that was rich in magnesium sulfate flowed through the parent body and it filled the, the tubes with magnesium sulfate rich water. And then when the water evaporated, the magnesium sulfate precipitated out on the interior of the tubes. We see negative uh, characteristics in silicon uh, and, and in phosphorus. Uh, but in iron, it's negative. So there's much more iron in the rest of the rock than in the filaments. But most interestingly, uh, and a slight uh, negative image in, uh, in nitrogen, but in sodium, everything's the same. Now, if these were modern uh, contaminants, 
that kind of a picture should not uh, be, be encountered. One of the things I was trying to find out is how long does it take for nitrogen to go away? This was as a 32,000 year old guard hair from a uh, Pleistocene woolly mammoth and it contains 11.6% nitrogen and you can see here a very sharp definitive nitrogen peak there. <coughs> and in looking at the filaments, these are filaments in the Orgay meteorite and we're looking at nitrogen content, all of them, but they're mostly listed at 0.5%. That essentially means I didn't detect any nitrogen at all, the reading was zero. But I can say, okay, I know I can detect nitrogen if it's above 0.5%, so I can, I can be generous and say, well, uh, there could have been 0.5% nitrogen, but it was probably lower than that. There was one or two, here's one that got all the way up to two, but this is fungus, and these are living cyanobacteria. These are, are uh, 1,000 year old mummies from uh, uh, the uh, Peruvian mummies. Uh, these are 5,000 year old pre-dynastic Egyptian mummy hair and tissue. And, and this is uh, from a 40,000 year old woolly mammoth hair and tissue. And these are 2.7 billion year old cyanobacteria and 500 million year old trilobites. Again, exactly the same as you have in the orgate filaments. But we have very strong reason to believe that trilobites were at one point in time biological entities. This is that big beautiful thing that was up on the top and, and notice here it has a huge carbon content, 45% uh, atomic, uh, the oxygen carbon 0.34, uh, nitrogen less than 0.5%. Uh, this is very clearly an acrotarch belonging to the genus Leosphoridia. This is an acony. Uh, acrotarchs are extinct. Uh, extinct things don't crawl into uh, meteorites. Uh, here are fimbriae. These are Lophotrichus tufts of fimbriae on uh, uh, cyanobacteria. Uh, these are extremely tiny nanostructures that we can see here at, uh, we're taking a picture at 80,000 X, uh, and you see these, these little tiny fibrils, coiled fibrils, are about 30 to 40 nanometers in diameter and up to uh, maybe three quarters of a micron in length. But that shows the incredible degree of preservation because to preserve things that are that, that tiny and that fragile is amazing. Uh, this is a beautiful cyanobacterial filament with the sheath in filled with magnesium sulfate. But when we look at this point here, uh, we, this is the, the point that I'm showing there, we get a, a, a carbon content of 71% oxygen 10.0. So it has essentially been converted to carriage. This is in the Polinarua. Uh, these are planktonic diatoms, uh, and, and this, is, this is the meteoritic diatoms. Uh, you can see what are called Rimoportuli, Arioli, and Cribra. Uh, this is from terrestrial cyanobacteria of the same uh, genus and species, Alicocera ambigua. And you can see these little tiny bumps uh, that are called the Cribra and these little holes, the areoli. So uh, it, it is clear, and, and this uh, uh, structure here uh, that is uh, the uh, single east where the two cells uh, attach together. So it is very clear that this is the genus Alicocera species ambigua, and the problem is that is a polar marine diatom. Polar marine diatoms have no business being on top of a mountain 10 degrees away from the equator. That's completely out of character for those guys. Here is a heterocyst uh, in a living calithrix, and here we see these same kind of organisms, uh, calithrix with basal heterocysts in the Argay meteorite. Those, cal those uh, heterocysts are very important for the fixation of uh, nitrogen. This is a very unusual hystricosphere, very high carbon content, high aluminum content, very unusual structures, these long spikes coming out. This is a 100 micron bar, so this is absolutely gigantic uh, in the Poland Rural Meteorite. It is, it is some kind of a stricosphere or presenophyte, but I haven't been able to identify. The Biomex laboratory mounted on the ISS Veda module in, in July uh, 24, 2014, 
carry bacteria, algae, fungi, and tardigrades, and they all survived the exposure to the deep space environment. Uh, so that, that shows that uh, they, they have no great difficulty. They were outside the ISS and Biomex for 450 days. One of the most exciting results uh, that uh, we had uh, last May, uh, this is, do we have an yeah. alarm going on or something? Amber alert. Oh, amber alert, I see. Uh, these are diatoms. This is in the organic CI1 carbonaceous meteorite. So uh, a lot of people like to argue, well, gee, are you really sure those things are biological? Well, no one is going to argue that those are all biological diatoms. So they are, in fact, recognizable, they can be identified, uh, they are uh, a species of Pinularia, uh, the genus Pinularia species Sigeriana. Uh, Pinularia Sigeriana was described by Neil Fogut from New Zealand, uh, and they've only, they've only been found in New Zealand. And then in the Orgay meteorite, which was actually uh, uh, landed in uh, the south of France. But the south of France is a very long way for a dead diatom to swim. Uh, these are, are different kinds of organisms. Uh, these are framboidal plates with spines of alveolata uh, in the organ meteorite. Uh, so here we have again alveolata in organ. Uh, and uh, other pictures, this is Penularia sigeriana. Uh, that is uh, uh, living uh, from, or was right before the SEM was made, from New Zealand. Uh, it, it is 17.1 by 3.8 microns. Here is our pinularia in the organ meteorite, 17.1 microns and 3.7 microns wide. Uh, and here's pinularia, uh, 8 million year old pinularia from the Beacon Valley of Antarctica. So here is very, very clear evidence of that particular species of diatom in the Orgay meteorite, and I am totally convinced that it was alive and died on the parent body long before the meteorite entered the Earth's atmosphere. There are problems with the endogenous origin of life, and one of the problems is that all 20 of the protein amino acids have never been formed by Miller-Urey synthesis. Abiotic homochorality has never been obtained in the laboratory. Phosphate and phosphorylization that are essential to biomolecules uh, they are absolutely crucial for metabolism and machinery of life, but phosphate was almost absent on the early Earth. So the, the RNA world hypothesis versus the iron, world, uh, iron sulfur world hypothesis, if there was ancient biochemistry of, of life on Earth that originated in an iron sulfur type of molecule, one has to ask when, how, and where uh, was it possible that the metabolic machinery could have changed so that phosphate became absolutely uh, uh, essential for all life on Earth. Simple cells just simply do not exist. Uh, this is the DNA of the gyrase enzo uh, enzyme. Uh, this is the a transmission electron microscope image of a bacterial flagellar motor. And it looks exactly like a motor that General Electric would build. Yet, these bacteria figured out how to do Edison kinds of design drawings uh, at least 3.8 or 3.9 billion years before Edison came around. Uh, the human genome contains 3.2 uh, billion base pairs. Here's Polycaos dubium. It has 670 billion base pairs. So there are a lot of unicellular organisms that have far more, uh, more base pairs than the human genome. This is very interesting because this shows biogenic carbon isotopes in the issue of appetites, uh, grains, filamentous fossils of the order of 4.2 to 3.8 billion years old. So as soon as the earth gained liquid water, there is evidence that there was life here. So there is no long period for a, a slow chemical evolution of life on earth. And in fact, uh, uh, Gordon did a linear regression genetic, uh, of genetic complexity and came to the conclusion that from this, extrapolating back to, uh, on the genomes, that life probably originated 9.7 billion years ago, and that's embarrassing when our entire solar system is only 4.5 billion years ago. So that says, well, how could that happen? Well, if you 
have the first stars forming up in here, the Big Bang, if that's the Big Bang is really correct, uh, and the accelerating expansion. You have the first stars forming, and somewhere in this time period was the origin of life, but that puts it considerably before the formation of our own solar system. So, maybe one way of explaining this is by extrasolar comets that might have traveled by uh, a great star that was truly ancient, and we have some examples uh, of stars that are ancient. One of the ones that I'm particularly interested in is this M1 red subdwarf, a captain star, which contains Captain B and Captain C, and this was probably captured while a globular cluster passed through our own, our own uh, Milky Way galaxy, and as it came through, uh, this was accreted during this transfer, and this particular uh, uh, captain star, uh, 8.5 uh, thousand uh, BC, was only seven light years away from Earth. Now, if you say, okay, what happens to a body like this if you have something like this great interstellar comet, uh, Umaru, uh, Umuamua, I think that's the right pronunciation for this strange beast, which came through our solar system in 2017. Uh, if, if an object like that, traveling, it traveled through our solar system at 58,000 miles per hour, a little bit faster than escape velocity from, uh, uh, from our own solar system, uh, which is about 35,000 miles an hour, but traveling at 58,000, sorry, miles per second, 58,000 miles per second, you have a, a total time of tra a transit of 85,000 years to go from, from a seven light year body to the planet Earth, uh, which means that uh, you could easily have bodies that are much further away than captain stars that could, uh, if it provided a biology to an object that escaped that, that stellar system, could travel to Earth with material frozen inside of the ices and remain alive during the transit, even if the transit took time periods of the order of tens of millions of years. And being on the inside of ice and water and rock, you would be well protected from radiation that everyone says is going to totally kill all biology during panspermia. So, the cometary panspermia hypothesis, especially the extrasolar comet panspermia hypothesis, it dramatically alters the time period available for prebiotic chemistry, molecular and cellular evolution. Comets and meteorites provide a wide array of conditions that are available for either the RNA world or the iron sulfur world to lead to the origin of life. And cometary jets allow for the concentration of solutes. Spinning comets give the natural DNA uh, polymerase chain reaction conditions. And this provides a, a wonderful mechanism for the distribution of life once life is formed. Comets might well be the site for the RNA world or the iron, iron sulfur world, but the hot cold cycling as comets tumble near perihelion and the rapid evaporation from uh, internal pressures destroying the crust gives rise to the possibility for the uh, organics to be concentrated together where they can react and also for the amplification. Uh, these clay minerals like uh, montmorillonite and so forth are found on comets and uh, on carbonaceous meteorites and they are uh, accepted on earth as being associated with uh, uh, microbial life in the, in the soil. So comets could be the birthplace of amino acids and possibly even life itself. So in conclusion, the problems there, there are with the current uh, theory of the origin of life models suggest that life on earth may have been delivered to the early Hadean Earth rather than originated here de novo. Life conditions uh, of water, energy, and biogenic elements coexist on almost all the comets, planets, and moons of our solar system, and we have no reason to believe that they would not also coexist on moons and planets of, uh, and comets of other star system, and we now know from the studies done by the Kepler uh, Observatory and so forth, that star systems containing planets are profoundly abundant. The abu absence of nitrogen in fossils of cyanobacteria, acrotarchs, and diatoms in carbonaceous meteorites proves that they are indigenous and therefore they were present in the meteorites when they entered the Earth's atmosphere 
and consequently are extraterrestrial. So the fundamental conclusion is that extraterrestrial life exists. Life on Earth may have formed on comets or exoplanets more, more ancient than our sun and been transported to the early Earth by interstellar comets. And I have been fortunate to work with many people, uh, like Professor McCrumas sitting in uh, Ryuman and, and Kaperlov at the Joint Institute for Nuclear Research, uh, Claude Perron and Rosanel Strick at uh, Musée d'Histoire Naturelle de Paris, Miladier at Montauban, Paul Sapira uh, at the Planetary Studies Foundation, Bill Birch at the Victoria Museum, and had many discussions with Academician Rosanov, uh, Academician Galimov, and Rosemary Herdman Hurt, Hurt, at Institute Pasteur, and also with the late Georgie Zavarzin and Ludmila Gerasimenko of the Institute of Microbiology of the Russian Academy of Sciences. And I thank you very much for your kind attention. Okay, we can take just a few questions. We've got to break up and get out of here before nine. So, are you willing to take a few questions? I'll be happy to, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, there's a theory that life that about is related to panspermia that approximately 11 billion years ago, when the background radiation of the um, of the universe was room temperature. Uh, do you think that might have might, might have improved the odds of life forming? Um, well, the problem in answering that question is I don't know what life forms. So I don't know whether that would have improved the the odds or not. The, the one thing we can say for certain is that life forms somehow, somewhere, and some when, because it's here. Uh, but precisely the, the answer to that question is still one of the greatest mysteries. Uh, it, it could well be that that would have been beneficial, uh, uh, but uh, you know, there uh, actually uh, I don't see any real problem for life forming even in cold environments uh, uh, like for example on comets or uh, at least when comets come closer to the sun when they they go through this uh, uh, periodic period of uh, warming other comments or questions so the uh, Allen Bill meteorite with the uh, uh, structures that were found in there several years ago I remember you gave a talk a long time ago about that it, it, the Allen Hills meteorite was uh, uh, studied for containing possible biology. As you know, it contained these nanofossils. Uh, and uh, Dave McKay and his co-workers did a, a very, very careful job of dividing everything up and having people that had no idea what they were working on, like Dick Zare, for example. He was giving three samples. One was called Minnie, one uh, uh, Mickey, and one Goofy. Uh, and he had no idea which was the Allen Hills meteorite and which were other meteorites that had nothing to do with Allen Hills. But he came to the conclusion that the paws in the sample that belonged to Allen Hills were indeed uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons and they were indigenous to the, uh, the rims of the possible uh, regimes containing the microfossils. David McKay, after publishing this, there was a big debate, and lots of scientists said hogwash, nonsense, totally ridiculous and absolutely impossible. And, and so after a short back and forth, or a lengthy back and forth with many different critics, uh, it actually got to the point that David couldn't get his papers published. Didn't matter what new results he got, uh, he would send it to science and so forth, and they would be promptly rejected. And the, the troubling thing is that David's nanofossils, I can't look at them and tell you that I'm sure they're fossils because they're too small. They don't contain definitive structures. These things that I'm showing you are gigantic. I mean, these are big enough you can see with the naked eye. Uh, but David's were very, very small. Now, in his latter research, he found some filaments very much like the cyanobacterial filaments that I've been seeing. And I have some of his pictures but I've never published them because he died before he published them and I have never uh, gotten permission to, to publish them. So, uh, but he did find some things sort of similar in, uh, in Zagami and, and in Allen Hills. So, uh, and, and there's a colleague in uh, Canada 
that's doing a lot of work with uh, uh, Martian meteorites and is finding biogenic elements and biomolecules, particularly keratins, and, and also evidence of microfossils uh, that are very similar to cyanobacteria. NASA's currently considering some projects that will return samples from asteroids and comets to the Earth. Does that represent danger? The, let me put it this way. When you go to return a sample from a comet or an asteroid, uh, I think there is a very real possibility that you will return a sample containing life. Now, way back in 1996, I attended meetings at NASA Johnson Space Center where they were just beginning to talk about sample return from, uh, uh, from comets. And one of the most asinine things of all is they were talking about the sample would be put in a, a sealed container that would be totally capable of surviving impact on the Earth, even if the parachute didn't work. But also, there was plans to use high levels of radiation to sterilize the sample material in the spacecraft on the way back home. And when I heard about this, I thought, you're going to go, if you find extraterrestrial life, you want to make sure you kill it before you get a chance to study it. Now, that to me is just plain stupid. Uh, I mean, you have no, well, first of all, if, if it's an Andromeda strain, well, we're cooked anyhow because we've got lots, lots of rocks on Earth from Mars and they're coming in all the time and we don't have a, a shield to protect us from comets and cometary debris and debris coming in from the moon or from, uh, uh, from Mars. So I think, I think this whole idea of, gee, we've got to worry about uh, bringing back samples is, is kind of foolish. But the thing that I think, is, I mean, I think it's perfectly okay when you bring the samples back, that you put them in quarantine. There's no problem with that. In fact, I think that should be done because you should make absolutely certain that you not contaminate your sample with terrestrial life. So you can be sure that if you've got biology, you can say, okay, this is what it is. We know for a fact it came from an extraterrestrial source, and we know we've got a sample of extraterrestrial life. But you could also show that because you, by, by doing analysis of stable isotopes in the material, you should be able to readily differentiate between terrestrial biology and extraterrestrial biology. <coughs> so that's my opinion. <laughs> yes? Have any of the rocks brought back from the moon been tested? Uh, the rocks that were brought back from the moon, uh, we, we, as soon as the... Uh, first astronauts came back, uh, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, and then the Apollo 12 astronauts, they immediately went into quarantine because at that point in time, everybody thought, well, there may be biology on the moon and maybe we ought to worry about it and uh, perhaps uh, this is uh, something to be concerned about. Well, um, it was uh, Pete Conrad that cut off the surveyor camera that was on the moon when he went on his mission, and he brought it back. And when he brought that camera back, they immediately went into a sterile clean room, and with the top level microbiologists of this country, they started doing an analysis by removing each of the lenses and disassembling the camera and taking sterile swabs and putting it into different kinds of nutrient media. And Nothing seemed to happen until about two weeks. And then they got a little white growth in one of the tubes that came from an inner lens element of the camera. It was immediately recognized that this was biology, and this biology was sent to the Center for Disease Control for analysis and proper care and handling in case it was a deadly pathogen. And it turned out it was Streptococcus mitis. Well, every time you talk, you spit out little particles containing Streptococcus mitis and a whole zoo of other bacteria from your, your mouth. 
bacteria happen. So uh, the problem was these were in a spore state. And the scientists that had done this analysis concluded that when the camera was being assembled, at that point in time, somebody probably coughed or sneezed and contaminated that inner lens element. And it went to the moon and sat on the moon for 350 days or so. And the radiation environment and the thermal cycling and so forth killed everybody except these hardy little Streptococcus mitis that went into a spore state and then came back alive. Well, I wrote an article about it. It was published in uh, Science at NASA. And uh, uh, right after that, uh, uh, people at NASA headquarters, uh, particularly John Rommel, who was in charge of planetary protection, came out with another article saying, no, 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 that was all wrong. That isn't what happened at all. What happened was when it got back, the guys in Houston contaminated it themselves after it returned. And, and he claimed to have seen pictures of them examining the camera. And actually, I saw one of the pictures. And, and you got a bunch of guys sitting around examining the camera with no mask, no gloves. Well, that really happened. But that was after the microbiological analysis had been completed. So it was a fraudulent photograph. It was a hoax in that it was not accurately reflecting what really happened there. So uh, the question is then, why would John Rommel, the planetary protection officer at NASA, want to say, this is all bogus, that bacterium didn't live on the moon for two and a half years? And I finally figured it out. John Rommel didn't want to mention the possibility that bacteria might be able to survive on the moon for a long period of time. Because when all of our astronauts went to the moon, they consumed food and they produced waste. And when you're on the moon and you're getting ready to come back, do you bring back, I mean, you have to bring back certain samples of human material for the medical people. But would you rather bring back all of your human material, or would you rather bring back that mass in lunar dust and rocks? And the answer is it makes much more sense to bring back that material in moon rocks and dust. When we went to Antarctica, we brought back everything. Then we took in, we brought everything back. And we, when we had waste material, it ultimately was collected and then put in the fuel drums that carried our fuel in. And that came back, and that went back to South Africa for disposal. But the problem is, I have no doubt whatsoever that inside the various lunar excursion modules that are sitting on the moon, there are containers that contain terrestrial biology. In fact, even if they hadn't left human waste, they had to have left flecks of skin and uh, things that were breathed out and so forth because they weren't in a bubble while they were inside of these things and were continually shedding DNA and hair and, and all of those hair follicles and so forth are just totally teeming with nice little bacteria. Mostly good guys. If you're ill, they might be some bad guys. But I think that was the problem. The planetary protection officer did not want anybody to ask the question or discuss a horrible scenario that I just did. And I apologize for that because it's sort of before some people may want to go to dinner, but please forget that. Yeah, we're going to have to cut it off because we do have to be out here. The library is really enforces that. And what we do is we do have a social get together after this. We usually go to the IHOP. And so if you're interested, let me know because we may have to choose which one to go to according to how many people want to go. Uh, sometimes we go to the one on Drake because we get service there fastest. But if we get a, a large contingency want to go, we may have to go to the one from the university. So just let me know if you want to go to IHOP. And so we can pick and choose. Want to do a show of hands? Yeah, have me pick one of the IHOP members. That's right. four or five, six. Small enough for Drake, probably. All right, we're going to Drake. We'll all, we'll all right. can be in Drake after we pack up here. All right. Okay. Drink it in. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.